Not right now. Okay. All right. We'll get started, but here we go. Uh, I'd have gotten here sooner. I just had to bring my wife, and she doesn't move early in the morning, so which is okay. All right, let's see. <clears throat> so this is chapter two. So in that chapter two, okay, the chapter two, what we're going to look at, we're going to look at what's called the molecular representation. All right. And once again, this is a <clears throat> this is something that's kind of strange about this stuff is that this portion of chemistry only deals with carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Only deals with those four. And yet from those four elements, there can be a hundred million compounds made. So it's just so it's so different. So there, there's got to be a way to write this e effectively or, or, or shorthand notation. Uh we can look at uh, this is called isopropyl alcohol or isopropanol. Now, if you see the ending with the OL, that means it's got to be an alcohol. Okay, so that's an alcohol. So if we look at the Lewis dot structure for this, So this would be isopropanol, isopropanol or isopropyl alcohol. We could write it that way. We could also write it as C3H or C carbon uh, OH H CH3. We could write it that way. This is what's called partial condensed. Not too important, you know all these different names, just the different ways in which you can write this. It's, it's kind of interesting. CH3, C, CH, OH. This would be condensed. And then last we could write it as a molecular. Like that. All right. Now, last week I asked you to come up with the constitutional isomers. This, we're getting to a point on this though. I should write the constitutional isomers. Well, for C3HHO. So I should write the three constitutional isomers for this. One of them is going to be the isopropanol. So that would be the C H H H C O H. There's an H and then so there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight hydrogens, three carbons, and one oxygen. So that's one of the isomers. And this is isopropanol. That's isopropanol. That's one of the constitutional isomers for C3HAO. Another one is propanol. And that's going to be written as simply where this OH is on the center carbon, we can put it on one of the end carbons. And it doesn't matter which end carbon we put it on, it's still going to be the same. And this is called just. That's just propanol, okay? Or what we can do is we can make what's called an ether, all right? And in that case, the carbon is going to be in between, I'm sorry, the oxygen is going to be in between any one of the, any one of the two car, any one of the three carbons. So we could write this as, we could put it here. Uh, 
right? And how you name this, these ethers are kind of fun to name. Uh, I think they're kind of fun. This group right here with the CH2, this is an ethyl, all right? This group, this lone carbon, is a methyl. <clears throat> and if you have an oxygen sandwiched between two carbons, that becomes what's called an ether. That's an ether. And so you typically label these alphabetically. So this becomes ethyl, methyl, Ether. And those are going to be the three constitutional isomers of C3HHO. Right. That makes sense. Now, yeah. hopefully, as you saw, writing molecules this way seems it, it it takes forever. It doesn't happen very quickly. So, there's got to be a better way to write these things. Right. There'll be a much better way to write this. And there's what's called the bond line formation. All right. Oh, we're all sorry. Well, the bond. This is simply going to be a line. Uh, so in essence, the line, <clears throat> these represent chemical bonds. They represent chemical bonds. The angle, this represents the atoms. Or more importantly, the nucleus of these atoms. That's what it represents. So, for example, if we have C6H14, and if we were to draw that out, it would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. That kind of little bold. Then we have to attach hydrogen to this. Now remember, carbon has four bonds. That's about as much mass as you'll get in organic chemistry. Be able to count to four. So there's the six carbons right there. Now, that seems to take forever. So there's a shortcut way, way on how to draw this. So how you can draw that is, like I said, the bond angle. So how you would draw this, let me just start out here a little bit. We'll make it a little bit simpler. This carbon is going to be carbon one. This is going to be carbon two. This is going to be carbon three, four, five, six. So there's going to be your six carbons. This would actually be called hexane. The name of this is hexane. Maybe a hexane. Now, since we've got the six carbons, how do we draw this, or how do we write this uh, shorthand notation, or the bond angle formation? Well, it's going to be this way. So this right here represents carbon one. This represents carbon two, carbon three, carbon four, carbon five, and then carbon six. And what they do is, is they leave off the hydrogens. They just leave the hydrogens off because they're ubiquitous, they're everywhere. We know that each one of these carbons actually has six, has four bonds associated with it. And so down here, this carbon would have the three hydrogens, one, two, three, because it's gonna have four bonds. Here's one of the bonds. This carbon, carbon number two, is gonna have two hydrogens. And so it would actually have two hydrogens associated with it. And then these would be the other two bonds. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense? Okay, good. It, it, it yes, That's how you end up drawing a lot of these. Uh, let's see here. 
Now, in this case, this happens to be hexane, but we can also draw this several different other ways. Uh -huh. We could draw this molecule. Now, each one of these different molecules are going to have different names, okay? So another way we could draw this is we could draw this as... <clears throat> We could draw this as CH3. This would be a carbon. This would be another methyl group. Hydrogen. So these are going to be referred to as methyl groups. Right. We have a carbon, hydrogen, hydrogen, carbon. Hydrogen. This would be this. Now, notice what you see here now is that this carbon is bonded to two methyl groups instead of just having a hydrogen here. And this throws one, two, three, four, five, six. You count the number of hydrogens. There's six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. <clears throat> so, how would you draw this? Well, one way you can draw this, and this is going to help you. When you when we get to what's called when we get to nomenclature, it, it kind of looks for the longest chain. Now, longest chain does not have to be perfectly linear. All right, it doesn't have to be that way. But this is one of the ways I do. It. And you're going to want to do some when it comes to nomenclature. Try to identify the longest chain. That's sometimes referred to as the parent chain. And so in this case, we have one, two, three, four, five. We have five carbons. So we'll start out with a five member chain. One, two, three, four, five. Oops. Got one, two, many. All right. So it's going to look as such. All right. Now, if we were to number these carbons, we could number this as carbon one. We're going to number just the ones in the longest chain. So there's number one, number two, three, four, five. So there's the five carbons. Here's one, two, three, four, five as such. <clears throat> now, what do we do with this methyl group that's 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 hanging off of this chain? Now, the one that's hanging off the chain, this is referred to as a substituent, right? So this would be your parent chain, and that would be your substituent, and that's going to go. And, and notice that it goes off the second carbon. So there's your second carbon. And if we were to name this, and we might as well start looking at this a little bit, this is a methyl group, okay? And we could have numbered this as one, two, three, four, five. It doesn't matter which. In this case, it doesn't matter which which way we number it. But we know that there's a methyl group coming off the second carbon, so we need to identify that. Well, we're going to have to identify that location. But I guess I got a little bit of ahead of myself. Let's first name the parent chain. So this parent chain is going to be pentane. That's pentane. Pent meaning five. And we have this methyl group coming off the second carbon, and that's going to, like I said, it's going to be a methyl group. And so this we refer to as 2 methylpentane, indicating that the methyl group comes off the second carbon. All right. Now we can also. <clears throat> write another uh, constitutional isomer for this. Now, we're not going to get all of them, but just the majority of them. We'll get look at another one. Another one we can look at is <clears throat> we can have four carbons in the chain. We have those four carbons come in, the, in the chain there. And coming off of this carbon, we can then have a methyl group. And coming off the second carbon, we can have a methyl group. So that means remaining, we have to put the remaining hydrogens on here. All right. So now our parent chain is going to have four carbons. One, two, three, four. All right. So we need to draw that chain. That would be two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Yep. All right. This here represents 
carbon one, carbon two, carbon three, and carbon four, as such. And then we've got a methyl group coming off of carbon two, right there. And then we have a methyl group coming off of carbon four. Oh, sorry, carbon three, I'm sorry, off of carbon three, as such. And if we were to name this, if we were to name this, four carbon chain is butane. All right, so it's going to be butane. And notice that we have these methyl groups coming off of carbon two and three. So we'd write two, three, the locations of those methyl groups. It'd be two, three, di methyl butane is how you would name that molecule. And we'll go more into the naming of these own, of naming of these compounds. All right. Okay. Now, these represent single bonds, but in organic chemistry, you can have things that have multiple bonds. You can have double bonds, you can even have triple bonds. Right. So how do you deal with a double bond? Let's say you want to look at double bonds. Let's say you want to look at double bonds. In that case, there'll be a double line. So there'll be a double line. So for example, you could have a molecule such as that. And what that would look like is that would be a CH3 carbon, double bond carbon. Uh, coming off that would be a, a methyl. All right. Now this carbon has four bonds. This carbon only has three bonds, so there's got to be a hydrogen coming off of that. This carbon only now has three bonds, so there has to be a hydrogen coming off of that. And then if we have a triple bond, if we have a triple bond, We have a triple bond. We have CH3 carbon, one, two, three. Carbon, okay. And then we can have a hydrogen here, such, all right? What that would look like is you could draw this as single bond. One, two, three, oops, oops, ah, it's been a while, Maya, sorry. Could look as such. So here, this would be carbon one, carbon two, carbon three. There's carbon one, carbon two, carbon three. Another neat thing that you can see in organic chemistry, you see what are called cyclic molecules. And there's a whole chapter on cyclic molecules uh, because they're they're fairly important. We'll look at just that kind of simpler ones or some more ones. We can look at cyclic structures. In this case, if we had a carbon bonded to another carbon. Uh, to a carbon such as that, such that we have three carbons in a ring, such that they would form a, a triangle. H2, H2, H2. This is cyclopropane, is what this is called. The cyclopropane. And we can draw it simply as a triangle. Whereas this is going to be stay there. So it's carbon one, two, three, one, two, three. All right. 
That makes sense. Hope that does. Yeah. And and you'll see the cycle. <clears throat> and the secret to a lot of these cyclic structures is going to be the bond angle. All right. It's going to be the bond angles. Uh, for stability. All right. So there's that one. And this one you'll see once in a while, it's not too uncommon. Uh, but there is gonna be quite a bit of bond strain in there. And, and, and you would learn as you go through the semester, as you go through the stuff of organic chemistry, you will, Dr. Baldwin will point out stability in that bond angle. If there's a lot of strain in that bond angle, it's, it's not a real stable molecule, okay? The next one that we can look at is we can look at cyclobutane. And this is a very stable molecule simply because of the, the, the strain and the bond angle. Okay. And that's really easy to draw. It's just simply going to be a a square, all right? So that's cyclobutane. We can look at cyclopentane. We can look at cyclopentane. That's going to be CH, oops, sorry, CH2. CH2. Coming off that carbon is going to be another CH2. CH2. CH2, CH2, and then they're going to be bonded such as that. And to draw that, it's simply going to be a, a five member ring such as that, pentagon. All right, so that's cyclopentene. And then the last one, and this would be the, probably the most stable of the ones, is going to be uh, cyclohexane. Cyclohexane, CH2, come down here, and then CH2, oh, come on, CH2. CH2, CH2, and then there's a CH2, CH2 down there. To draw that simplistic, simply is going to be a, a hexagon such as that. You can also have bridging carbons. You're going to have bicyclic. We're not going to get into that. I'll let Dr. Baldwin teach you that. I just simply want to get to... Uh, I just simply want to get to drawing some of these structures for you, or just how to think of these bond line formations. All right. And this is with carbon and hydrogen. So how do you do this bond angle uh, if you have things other than carbons and hydrogens? Here we have heteroatoms. So atoms, so what I mean by heteroatoms is I mean atoms other than carbon and hydrogen. Well, if we have atoms other than carbon and hydrogen, so an example of this would be acetone. And it's, a, it's a very popular solvent. It's a very polar solvent. Uh, for nail polish remover, there's two types of nail polish remover. There's either acetone or isopropyl alcohol. Usually the more expensive nail polish remover is going to be the acetone. Just know it because my wife paints her nails. This be CH3 carbon, another carbon, you got an oxygen with a CH3. Now for further reference, as I, I, as I, when I taught you in Chem 1, Chem 2, I always wanted to tell you what's coming up. This is a functional group. Uh, this functional group is called a ketone. All right. 
anytime you see a ketone, it's kind of nice because you sort of know where the attack is going to occur, that the reaction is usually going to have something to do with this carbonyl. And we'll talk a little bit about that if time permits. So how do we draw this molecule? Well, how we would draw this is that we have one, two, three carbons in a chain. So here would be carbon one, carbon two, carbon three. All right. My hands aren't working, it's too stinking early. Man, there's, this would be carbon one, carbon two, carbon three. There's carbon one, two, three, as such as that. All right. And then to draw this double bond oxygen or this or this carbonyl, simply be a double bond such as that. All right, so far so good. Let's see here now. I was I don't need to do that. I'm just gonna so we could do pentanol. And that's gonna have five carbons. So that's one, two, three, four, five. Uh, the OR tells you that's gonna be an alcohol. And so that's gonna be OH. So you have a hydrogen, 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 hydrogen. I know, hydrogen, so hydrogen. Said it a lot. There we go. So there's your pentanol. How would you draw this? Well, it would be simply two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. And then that would be an OH right there. Okay. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Oops. There's one, two, three, four. Let's see. So far, so good. Yeah. Okay. Now, if that isn't confusing enough, right? It turns out that geometry really matters in this stuff too, right? So geometry really matters, right? And in, in essence, we can do what's called also a, a 3D uh, bond line structure. We can do a 3D bond line structure. So for example, if we look at carbon, so we just, we're just gonna look at simply methyl, right? Be a hydrogen, hydrogen. Now, if you remember back in Chem 1, we said that the, the bond angle between a hydrogen carbon hydrogen in a in methane, this is going to be a tetrahedron, is not 90 degrees. So what that means is that this is not 90 degrees. It's actually 109.5. And what this means is you got these goofy, you got this triangle and you got this dash. Okay. This triangle here, this represents that means that the, the atom is coming out at you. Comes out of the page. So it's coming out at you, comes out towards you. These dashes going away, that means that the atom 
goes into the page. So it means it's going away from the reader. Now that will be important because in a, in a few chapters, you'll come up with the stuff called, I hope if I could spell, wouldn't, it, wouldn't that be nice? Stereo chemistry. And, and uh, I, this is where I completely got lost when it came to organic chemistry. But, and then if you're gonna look into, uh, there's another, uh, so this, this becomes important. And then lastly, there's this thing called Fisher projection. And I'm not gonna pretend to act as though I'm an expert in that stuff, because I've never taken biochemistry and I have no desire to ever take biochemistry. Uh, but Fisher projections become pretty important. And when you take that, you'll learn about Fisher projections. All right. See here now. We good with these structures? Yeah, I think so. Okay. You know, we're going to be using these quite a bit, all right? So these won't be unfamiliar to you. Okay, so now we'll get to my favorite topic, all right? And this is in organic chemistry. If you're kind of a Y person, which is which is what I am, that's why I did not make a very good organic chemist. Uh, however, my wife does say I would have been a very good organic chemist, because I do like this stuff a lot. I just wasn't mature enough and didn't have the background for it. A lot of I'll own it up on, on my own fault. Uh, but if you're if you look at if you're a Y person, the re let me step back. There are kind of two branches. There's really five branches of chemistry, but you can kind of break those branches up into two, and and and, and basically on, on on the type of questions you ask. For example, if you are a what person, you'll get along very well with organic chemistry. If your mind usually jumps to what is going to occur, what's this, what about that, what about this, then you you're going to be very good at, at, at organic chemistry. More than likely, it'll be something that it will resonate. Pun intended, you'll see why uh, with organic chemistry. Me, on the other hand, I'm, I'm a why person. I'm, I'm always asking why. I very rarely ask what. Uh, I'm almost always asking why does this occur? Why would this? Why that? Why, why, why? And that gets you more into the organic, I'm sorry, into more of the physical and the analytical type of chemistry. But it's also important, at least in organic chemistry, why do certain things occur? And a lot of this has to deal with what's called electronegativity, which you talked about. And do you remember what the most electronegative element on the periodic table is? Fluorine. Exactly. 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 And the second most electronegative element on the periodic table is oxygen. And that becomes an important one to remember. And then you've got the halogens, all right? So that's kind of the process in which this occurs. So for example, if you look at say ethanol, and we started out last week looking at ethanol, all right, so this is ethanol, compared to dimethyl ether, you can have That's going to be dimethyl ether. Now, what happens is, is because oxygen has such a high electronegativity, it's going to pull these electrons towards the oxygen, making this partially negative and this hydrogen partially positive. That is because what's going to happen, uh, Mina, in all of this is you're going to have to draw. Uh, uh, oh my goodness! There's, uh, oh my goodness! I just lost. I just lost my train of thought. You're going to have to draw a mechanism. Mechanism is what you're going to have to draw. And mechanisms are the heart of organic chemistry. When Dr. Baldwin asks you to draw arrows, don't run away from a minor. And if you have no clue whatsoever, you say, I don't know what I'm doing, go in his office and talk to him. 
the sooner you get mechanisms, and I'm being, I can't be any more honest and, and straightforward than this, the more enjoyable organic chemistry will be. If you run away from mechanisms and kind of ignore them, it's going to be the biggest pain in the butt you've had. And you are going to hate your life. And I can't be any more truthful than that. Uh, mechanisms, mechanisms, mechanisms. And how you're going to draw those arrows is you're going to look for stuff like this. Always look for this oddball thing, these functional groups. We're going to start going over these functional groups, but that's what you need to do. Now, because of this, this is polar. And to give you a little bit of a heads up now, is that because this oxygen is pulling electron density towards the oxygen, making this positive, that means something that's partially negative can now attack this carbon. Does that make sense? Because opposites attract. If you have something like an ether, this is nonpolar. Those two are going to cancel themselves out. However, this is still going to make this partially positive. That oxygen is going to be partially negative. And this carbon is going to be partially positive, which means we can still have a lot of very interesting chemistry occurring because you may have something that's partially negative that's going to attack one of these two carbons, or you may have something that's partially positive that can attack that oxygen. Does that make sense? And a big thing here is, and we'll, we'll, I'm just going to tell you exactly straight out how it is, to break these carbon-hydrogen bonds is more than likely not going to occur very much. It can occur, but it, it's kind of a difficult thing to occur. All right. But to understand organic chemistry, to get it, you got to get that. You got to get those uh, those mechanisms, and we'll, we'll, we'll hopefully we'll have some time to work on that. All right. Now the other thing. Now this is a big deal. This becomes a big deal. And this is called resonance. Now, the reason this is a big deal is because this shows stability. All right, stability. And most things in nature are going to work themselves to be low in energy, which means they're going to be stable. Right? So anytime we see stability, it really means low in energy. Right? So that's low in energy. Now, for now, what 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 do I mean by this? What what do I mean by this? Well, some molecules cannot be re represented by a single Lewis dot structure. All right. So some molecules will have multiple Lewis dot structures. All right. <clears throat> An example of that. An example of that, I remember H O minus. All right. If we were to draw this out, this would be H carbon double bonded oxygen and H poorly. Now, because it's drawn this way, the negative charge is going to be on the nitrogen. Okay. Now, ideally, the oxygen would like to have that negative charge because it has a higher electronegativity, but there's no reason this isn't possible. Okay. It could be, and you write for this word, equilibrium was another structure. Was another structure. So we could draw this now as hydrogen. Carbon, single bonded oxygen, that would then have a negative charge, double bonded nitrogen, hydrogen. Now, both of these are possible, right? So, both of these are possible. There's no reason I haven't done anything wrong with these. Both of these are possible. In this case, this means that this molecule has two.
present structures. All right. The more a molecule, wait, we'll rewrite that again. The more resonant structures the molecule has, the greater its stability. All right. And that becomes a big deal. It becomes a huge deal. So you're going to do, probably within the first couple of weeks, you'll be drawing a lot of resonance structures. And the sooner, you, the better you can draw them, the better it will be. Now, what does this mean? What, what does this mean? Let, let's look at these two structures. What possibly does this mean? Well, let's look at the, the difference between these. What happened here is that we have a negative charge on the nitrogen, and over here, we have a negative charge on the oxygen. In essence, in essence, the negative charge can spell not very well. The negative charge is delocalized. It's going to be delocalized. Meaning, it's not just on one atom. All right? Now, how does this make any sense? So I always kind of look at, when I when I see this, when I look at this delocalization of charge, I my, my brain always goes to insurance. So for example, have you ever heard of an insurance company called Farmer's Insurance? How yeah. That, yeah, yeah. Most people have it's a nationwide insurance company. How that got started was a group of farmers were living where they were neighbors back a long time ago. And and sometimes crops can get destroyed. Well, a few years ago in northeastern uh in eastern Iowa, they had this very freak windstorm and it just blew across. It wasn't a tornado, it was just sheer inline winds, and it destroyed millions of acres of crops. Now, if you're a farmer and you lose crops for a year, you're pretty much done farming. However, they had this thing, it's called insurance, obviously. And so how this farmer's insurance started out was that a group of farmers lived next to one another and they put in a bunch of money into a pool, into a pot, and said, if Farmer Joe's crops get destroyed, he can live off of this money. Does that make sense? And so that's how insurance works out, is that you, you pay, you, you have a, you have a, if you drive an automobile, you have to have auto insurance in case you get in an accident then that insurance company helps pay to replace your your uh, your vehicle uh, is, is how that works. And, and so you pay these premiums. The insurance company puts these premiums into a pool. And of course, they don't pay themselves a lot of money, right? I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm being facetious. I used to go fishing with an insurance guy. And he said, oh, my goodness, what a racket. Uh, his boss never sold a claim and made $100,000 every year and didn't do a thing. And it's kind of a big waste. Uh, but that's sort of what is happening here, that this charge gets distributed among these multiple atoms. Thus, it's much more stable. All right. The actual molecule, what this molecule will actually look like, all right, what the molecule will actually look like I shouldn't have erased it, but you got it on your notes. Uh, what this actually will look like, the hydrogen, there's the carbon, there's the oxygen, there's the nitrogen, there's the hydrogen. That double bond that we kept playing with, it actually gets distributed among here, such that this becomes partially negative. So the oxygen is partially negative. The nitrogen is partially negative. And these bonds here are almost like a bond and a half. Okay. And that's what that looks like. All right. Uh, let's see here. So resonant structures are, uh, I'm just going to read off my notes. <clears throat> so resonant structures are not real. 
they're only the hybrid and they represent the true structure. That's what we're trying to, we're ultimately trying to get to what the true stru structure is. They're not really in equilibrium with each other. The electrons don't move. They're not isomers. Or sorry, let, me go, let me start over. So the rest of the structures are not real. They're only the hybrid that represents the true structure. Resonant structures are not in equilibrium with each other. The electrons don't move. They're not isomers. Isomers differ in the arrangement of the atoms only. Resonant structures differ in the electron arrangement. All right? All right, and then I'm just going to introduce this Maya, and then we can talk about when we want to meet next week. What what time works good for you? I'm just simply going to introduce this to you, and then we'll because it's a lot of stuff, and this is, this we want to spend a lot of time understanding this because this gets kind of to the beginning of of, of mechanism, all right? So beginning. The beginning of mechanisms. Uh, and so the heart of what this is, this is also called arrow pushing. That's what we call arrow pushing. It sounds kind of silly. And all this simply is, is we're just moving electrons. All right. And as in most arrows, you're going to have a head. And then you have a tail, right? And obviously the tail, <clears throat> this is where the electron pair, oops, wrong place, where the electron pair comes from. And then the head, is where the electron pair goes, right? Okay. And we'll have two rules, right? There's just two rules to this. Things to avoid. And I never understood this mine. And honestly, when I took this book, I never understood it. Uh, it wasn't until much, much later in life that it started to make sense to me. So we want to avoid breaking single bonds. All right. And, and, and an example of this, what I mean by this, and this does not occur. So what we have here now is we got a carbon right here that's a positive charge. And this, this carbon here is called a carbo cation. Carbo cation. And if you have this bonding pair coming in here to go there, you're basically breaking this single bond, all right? And this does not occur. You don't want to do this. You don't want to break these bonds like this. This does not occur. It does not occur. And if you're going to do that, which it's not going to happen, it will, you'd have to put a lot of energy into it. And then you would put the carbon. So this is going to break. That means that this carbon here is going to be the carbon cation because it has that busted. It's being busted. It's only got three bonds. And then you're putting a double bond there. That's not going to go. So you want to avoid breaking single bonds such as that. All right. These are just some of the things you want to avoid breaking. 
You see what we did? We broke a single bond right here, and it's not going to occur that way. Lastly, what we want to do, and if you look at this a little bit, you can draw this out, you go, oh, I see where I see what the problem is. But it's kind of hard to see. Probably not used to looking at that stuff. But no, I'm not. I don't look at it that often. I don't know. Okay. I haven't looked at this in three, four years. All right. The second rule we don't want to perform is we never exceed the octet. Now, this is not for everything else. This would be for the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. You don't want to exceed the octet rule for that. So, for example, we've got this molecule. All right. Now, recall that up here we have a hydrogen and we have a hydrogen, right? This is the same as CH3, carbon hydrogen, carbon hydrogen, oxygen, okay? Now what can happen is that one of these electrons can come in here and form a double bond, as that. Now what we've got left is we've got H3C hydrogen, Hydrogen, uh, no, I got ahead of myself. H3 carbon. And now we put a double bond between the oxygen and the carbon. And the problem here, the problem is that this carbon now has one, two, three, four, five. It has five bonds, so it has 10 electrons in its valence shell. And it cannot occur. It, that, that does not want to occur. If we were to do it over on this side, what it would look like is it would look as though it were as this. All right. And the problem is that this still has those hydrogens there. And so this carbon right here has one two, three, four, five, it had the five bonds, just as what we drew here. And so that's not going to be very, it's not going to happen. Carbon can't have more than eight electrons in its band shell. What can happen, so once again, this, this is not going to happen. This is, this would not happen. What is something that is acceptable? Well, what's what is something that is acceptable? We look at what can't happen. Let's look at something that is acceptable. So still under those two rules. Let's look at something that is acceptable. So for example, we go back to ketone, we go back to our, 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 our acetone. We have this, all right? So if I were to draw this out, you have CH. What can happen is that one of these bonding pairs can come up to oxygen all right, and we now have the H3C, C, and the negative, this becomes CH3. Now, this has a formal charge of negative that make, makes this carbon have a carbocation. So what we may now do, may once again here a, that's not spell. A carbon pattern, which is like this. So far, so good. This is acceptable. This does happen. Let's look at one more example, and then we'll try to figure out a time that works good for you for next week.
We can look at multiple errors. We can look at multiple errors. So let's say that we have a Now here what happens is that this lone pair of electrons can come in here and form a double bond, taking that pair up to there. Now, initially, as this double bond or this uh, lone pair of electrons comes in form of the double bond here, this carbon will experience for a brief moment 10 electrons. But because of that, it kicks those up to, up to the oxygen, kicks them up to the oxygen. And we get a hydrogen carbon double bond carbon. Remember, there was just two pairs of electrons up there. Now there's three that gives us a negative charge there. And this is a H. And this is what's called an enolate. So that is possible. We can do something like that. All right. So what we'll do next time is we will uh, we'll actually draw a bunch of resonance structures, pushing those arrows, moving them around. And that will give you a, a kind of an idea of how to, how to start move an arrow basically arrow pushing it's just it's, it's a skill uh, we'll do some of that by actually drawing resonance structures so i'll draw some molecules up there and then we'll draw all kinds of resonance structures for it so only a plan uh i'm gonna be out of town next thursday is there uh did you do this on Monday? Uh, yeah, but it would probably have to be closer to like mid afternoon because I work okay in the evenings and then I have and I'm volunteering in the mornings. That's fine. That's, fine. That's fine. I just since you're the only one on here, and I don't know where anybody else show up. I don't know where everybody else is. Uh, let's see. Yeah, we'll try to do Monday afternoon. What about what time? Two. Mm -hmm. Two sounds good. Two sounds good. All right, Mina. I will send out that at two, and hopefully, I won't forget. Uh, hopefully, this is helpful. Uh, but we're almost done with chapter two. We just got to do. We got to do a bunch of these resonance structures. Uh, we'll draw a bunch mm -hmm. of them up. Uh, yeah. You've been in science long enough that every time you do a new science course, it's a, it's as though it's a foreign language because of all the different verbiage. And this one is is really bad. Uh, in organic chemistry, there's just is a lot of verbiage. So we'll, if you don't get it all, my hope is that I, I don't I'm not giving any tests or any of that kind of jazz. But my hope is that when Dr. Baldwin talks about this in a in a couple of months, oh, I've seen that before. It, it'll kind of bring back some recollection of, yeah, yeah, now it's kind of starting to come together. At least that's what my goal is. So yeah. anyway, all right. If you have any questions, don't be afraid to ask them. So I'm going to, I'll send out a Zoom link now for Monday at at two o'clock. We're going to take the, we're going to take my in-laws up to the Upper Peninsula on Wednesday. Nice. We're going to stay overnight up there. I think they're getting, my father I think is getting kind of stir crazy. He's the kind of guy that always likes to go, 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 go. And and my wife and I are not real goers. So actually, my wife is even less. I, I went in less than 24 hours yesterday. I fished three lakes. <laughs> so I, <laughs> I tend to go a little bit more than her. But she, I, I asked her, why don't you, there's an Albanian living in Jackson. I said, why don't you, uh, why don't you take him to Jackson? And she just hasn't done it yet. So I don't know. Anyway. All right, but we're going to go to the Upper Peninsula on Wednesday of next week, and we won't get back till probably late Thursday night. So, 
Uh, that probably won't work. Unless Friday morning would work for you. Um, I'm going to be working VBS Perfect. Friday morning. So oh, That's more important than this. All right. So we'll do Monday at 2, which will be fine because it's supposed to be insanely hot and you can't do anything in that okay. time of day anyway. All right, Mina, you take care. God bless. Yep. Bye. Bye.